This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television. Your support makes UCTV's programming possible. Contribute online at uctv.tv slash support. Check out the YouTube original channel UCTV Prime at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. I'd like to welcome you all that have gathered for this event, a very special event for San Diego. I'd also like to welcome the thousands of people who are watching online, both here in San Diego, around the world, on campus at satellite locations, and in Mexico at the Sukut, the Cultural Center in Tijuana, and at Ibero Americana Universidad. It's a real pleasure to share this with as many people as possible. The University of San Diego is committed to improving the human condition by working for peace and social justice. To fulfill this vision, the Institute for Peace and Justice, as part of the Kroc School of Peace Studies, works with peacemakers, youth activists, and human rights activists around the world in places like Guatemala, Kenya, Liberia, Nepal, and the Philippines, to name just a few. Our goal there is to work with local partners to help to build more peaceful communities. Earlier this year, USD was named an Ashoka Changemaker Campus, a designation that is shared by only nine universities across the United States. USD created the Changemaker Hub to bring people together from all over campus to develop and implement solutions to social problems and to change the systems that create or perpetuate them. To meet that goal, we work with students to create the awareness, the empathy, and the ability to identify social problems. This two-day Compassion Without Borders Symposium and today's talk are part of that process. These are difficult times for many on both sides of the border here in the U.S. and in Mexico. The pursuit of peace can seem even more difficult in times of economic uncertainty. Under the auspices of the Joan B. Kroc Distinguished Lecture Series, today's talk will explore ways to cultivate peace and justice, both personal peace and justice and international peace and justice. These are central elements in the university's mission and in Catholic social teaching. They are also prerequisites to the wholesome, sustainable, peaceful communities around the world. Even before Provost Julie Sullivan announced the Dalai Lama's visit, the university created a steering committee to educate the campus and the greater San Diego community about these issues and about our speaker so that the talk is part of a larger and ongoing discussion. Ticket sales kept off numerous related events, including the continuing education lecture series with USD faculty, including Associate Professor Karma Lekshe Somo. We had guest speaker, the Venerable Lama Tenzin Dondon, who's the personal peace emissary to His Holiness, and also has been the guiding member of the steering committee in putting these events together. A Tibetan film festival sponsored by the Department of Theology and Religious Studies, an interesting combination, they worked with outdoor adventures and with residential life to bring eight different films to campus. The department also co-sponsored a discussion of meditation and contemplative studies with Assistant Professor Louis Komyathi and Lama Tenzin Dondon. Faculty and staff came together to discuss one of the Dalai Lama's books toward a true kinship of faiths, which includes the Dalai Lama's story of learning about Catholicism from Thomas Merton. The Alcala Park Readers Group was organized by the Department of Human Resources and the Center for Educational Excellence, and Copley Library offered an exhibit of the Dalai Lama's many publications. Resident assistants and other students, I think we have some right down here in the front row, won free tickets by participating in a bulletin board contest and essay contests. The essays, reflecting on the meaning of Compassion Without Borders, touched on the interfaith connections that emphasize our common humanity. On the artistic side, many of you may have already enjoyed some of the photography exhibits. There are two going on right now at the Institute for Peace and Justice, including one called Architects of Peace. It's a stunning collection of portraits by artist Michael Colopy and quotes from peacemakers around the world. Area high school students visited the exhibit this weekend with some USD students. 
and they uh, recorded their thoughts about the portraits. Then they read a page from the Dalai Lama's book, Ethics for a New Millennium, and added their youthful voices in a booklet of writing and art as a gift to His Holiness. The peace flags they created, which are reminiscent of Tibetan prayer flags, are greeting the Dalai Lama as he arrives here today. And the Changemaker Festival helps students to see how each individual can make a difference. I have a feeling that many of you have been to at least one, if not many more, of these events all over campus, and I think it's helped to prepare us to enjoy this event not as a single day, not as a celebrity event, not as something that's only going to happen once in a lifetime, which it is, but it can be so much more than that if we're prepared to make it more. One of the change-making projects is USD's Migrant Outreach Program. I'd like to invite Megan and Mallory Wilhelms, student facilitators of the Color Your World program, to present a mural created by migrant youth with support from the Center for Inclusion and Diversity. The mural was created to commemorate the Dalai Lama's visit to San Diego. The CASA program that they're part of encourages active service in the community, and the students benefit from the experience as much as those they serve. In the words of Mrs. Joan Crock, who made this all possible today, to her granddaughter, Amanda Latimer Smith, who is with us here today with many members of the Kroc family. Happiness can come from unexpected sources. A life of service is a happy one to live. And now I'd like to introduce, to bring us into the spirit of the event, an amazing guitarist, Pablo Sanz Viegas. Pablo has played all over the world. He's going to play some pieces to open your heart and mind to what is to follow. And uh, when His Holiness arrives, Pablo will also be playing a piece for His Holiness. He was brought here today by the International Community Foundation. Uh, please help me welcome Pablo Sanz Viegas. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure being here in such a special event. I'm going to play Coyumbaba by Carlo Dominiconi. This piece relates the journey of a humble man going through different emotions, as is typical in anyone's life. Tolerance, forgiveness, peace, happiness, love.
Thank you very much. I'm going to play Capricho Árabe by Francisco Tárrega. Your Holiness, I believe music is the language of the emotions that can create unity among different cultures. I'd like to honor you with Recuerdos de la Alhambra. It's a piece that recreates the sound of the fountains in the beautiful palace of Granada, La Alhambra, in Spain. It is a symbol of a cultural splendor, peace and tolerance of the three main cultures, Islamic, Jewish, and Christian, that lived in Spain for more than 800 years in peace. It's a great honor. Thank you, Your Holiness.
Thank you, Pablo, for bringing us to a garden of tolerance and understanding. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Gray-Payton, Assistant Vice President of Public Affairs at USD, and a member of the Three University Host Committee for the Compassion Without Borders Symposium. Welcome. As a member of the Compassion Without Borders Committee, I'd like to thank our sponsors, many of whom are here today, whose support has made this event possible. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the venerable Lama Tenzin Dandan. Lama Tenzin has been our lead uh, in this endeavor. He has worked for quite some time to bring His Holiness to San Diego, and we're very grateful for his support and for making this day possible. And now, President Mary Lyons will present His Holiness with the University of San Diego Medal of Peace. First of all, let me welcome all of you to our university, especially those of you for whom this is your first visit. We hope it will not be your last. Your Holiness, we are, of course, honored to welcome you to the University of San Diego, a Catholic university whose mission commits us to educate men and women to become ethical leaders dedicated to compassionate service. Our School of Peace Studies was established because of a generous benefactor Mrs. Joan Crock. She hoped that we would not only teach peace, but make peace. Your Holiness, as a spiritual leader, one who has strives and continues to live a life dedicated to peace by working for justice, you are truly a living witness to the greatest aspirations of our university. And thus, we are very honored today to present to you the University of San Diego Medal of Peace. shows that there's something great with this person. <laughs> if you remain here, then nobody knows. <laughs> Not very sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was pretty special. <laughs> And now it is my privilege to introduce to you Pam Omidyar, who is the founder of Humanity United, a foundation that is committed to building peace and advancing human freedom. She is the co-founder with her husband Pierre of the Omidyar Network, which promotes economic, social, and political change. Please join me in welcoming Pam to the podium. Thank you, President Lyons. Hello, everyone. I am honored and delighted to be with you here today and to introduce His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama to the University of San Diego. 
We are so fortunate to have His Holiness speak on the topic of how to cultivate peace and justice. His life has been dedicated to expanding harmonious living through universal human values and a shared understanding of each other's religious traditions. Surely, these are the underpinnings of a peaceful and just global society. His Holiness began his monastic education at the age of six, after being recognized a few years earlier as a reincarnation of the 13th Dalai Lama. In the middle of his studies, at the age of 15, His Holiness also assumed the role of Tibet's temporal leader, much earlier than planned after China's incursion into Tibet. Committed to peace through nonviolence, His Holiness continued working towards a peaceful resolution with China and continued his studies, earning a Geshe degree, the equivalent of a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy. However, uh, in 1959, His Holiness and many Tibetans were forced to leave the country and found safety in India. The Dalai Lama shares the status of refugee with over 15 million people around the world for whom lack of both peace and justice in their home country may mean years, sometimes their entire lifetime, spent away from home. His Holiness and so many Tibetans have been political refugees for over 50 years. During this time, His Holiness has advocated for the education and safety of his fellow Tibetans, has traveled around the world to share his message of secular ethics and religious harmony, and he has raised awareness of Tibet and its people's desire for genuine autonomy and freedom. In his spare time, he has written over 70 books and continues the full duties as a spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism. A testament to his work and universal acceptance of his teachings, His Holiness has received over 80 honors and awards from organizations and universities in nearly 30 countries. This includes the Nobel Peace Prize, the U.S. Congressional Medal of Honor, the Mother Teresa Memorial International Award, and this year, the Mahatma Gandhi International Award for Reconciliation and Peace, the Templeton Prize, and the University of San Diego Medal of Peace. His Holiness continued his political duties until last year when he officially retired. He continues to be the spiritual leader for millions of Buddhists around the world and an inspiration to religious and non-religious people everywhere. The Dalai Lama teaches us that peace and justice can coexist. Too often, we consider that peace requires foregoing justice or that seeking justice defers peace. This is a false choice. Justice and peace are inextricably linked. Too often, those working the peace negotiations are at odds with those seeking accountability for wrongs committed. Hidden intentions and narrow perspectives contribute to this problem. However, where there is a greater collective commitment to take on a broad and shared vision for the future, a good and just peace can result. In his recent book, Beyond Religion, Ethics for the Whole World, His Holiness writes about both peace and justice within the framework of compassion. Compassion and nonviolence are signs of courage, not weakness. It takes courage to engage one's enemy with understanding and dialogue rather than force. This has been the Dalai Lama's approach towards both peace and justice for the people of Tibet and elsewhere in the world. Unlike so many people forcibly oppressed throughout history, the Dalai Lama never embraced the idea of violent resistance. He understood from the very beginning that violence never, lead, never leads to lasting peace. Buddhist training has shown him how to use logic and a broad long-term perspective to understand that violence can only beget more violence. If only our world leaders use this higher standard of thinking and reflection in their political decisions. Your Holiness, thank you for your tireless efforts around the world to share your teachings. You've taught us that our personal peace can lead to world peace if we all make the effort. Please join me in welcoming His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama.
perhaps I take a few moments, I would like to speak or stand, stand. Oh. sort of show my respect. Now, each place, mainly university, where I speak, I've got this kind of, because of a cap. <laughs> so very useful. <laughs> So, the morning, I got another sort of cap, yeah, University. University of, University of California, San Diego. Uh, then I a little sort of doubt whether I should wear that or my own sort of cap, yeah. Uh, then I thought maybe if I kept, you see, that, that one received from another university, uh, you may find some little... Annoyed. Ka. Annoyed. <laughs> Uncomfortable. <No>. Uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so then I saw this there, but till someone give me this, I cannot touch. <laughs> <laughs> so I read that my own sort of because of the old old one. Okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I'm very, very happy and great honor uh, to see, receive you this medal, the, medal of peace. Medal. Thank you very much. I'm just another human being. We are the same. But this kind of awards or some of the medals, uh, then I feel, oh, this is some kind of recognition my small contribution for serving humanity in order to bring happier. So, so thank you very much. Uh, firstly, you invited me here. And secondly, you see you uh, give me this, so thank you. But then, I really impressed. Now, number of places and different countries. Now, quite often, I hear, I'm hearing what? compassion, peace, nonviolence, uh, and not only that, just a word, but. Many places, including this university, you see, there are pockets who are really making actual effort, implementation way, or effort, uh, more awareness about the value of compassion. Uh, so now, the topic of my talk, peace and justice. We have to know what's the real meaning of peace. If we consider peace is simply mere absence of trouble or violence, then sometimes under injustice rule, some superficial peace also possible. And opposite for justice, some violence also sort of involved. Now when we, uh, uh, when we sort of get deeper understanding about peace, that means, you see, firstly, genuine peace must come through inner peace, not out of fear not out of some kind of house there, in Dutch house there. Um, uh, appearance, just uh, uh, appearance. superficial hmm? appearance. Uh -huh. Peace must come through inner peace. So actually, violence and non-violence demarcation, uh, not on action, but on motivation. 
There are three levels of action. Physical action, verbal action, mental action. Three levels. So ultimate demarcation, peace and violence, is related with motivation, mental action. So for example, with sincere sense of concern of others' well-being, including sort of uh, city children or students, their well-being, or mother or teacher, sometimes using a little bit sort of harsh word or sort of what's today, harsh face. Method. Uh, but this actually non-violence because that kind of physical action or verbal action come out of genuine sense of concern of their well-being. So essentially that is non-violence. Other hand, motivation, want to cheat, want to exploit, want to take advantage, uh, and then use nice word, praising, uh, and including some sort of gift. Physical action looks non-violence. Verbal action looks non-violence. But because of the motivation, want to harm that. So essentially, violence. So the ultimate demarcation, of violence and non-violence, is entirely based on motivation. Yeah. So, out of compassion, a uh, sense of genuine concern of others' well-being, uh, then any action, essentially non-violence. So, non-violence, uh, because of the non-violence, we can say non-violence is the reflection. Expression. Uh, expression. Expression of warm-heartedness. So, so long you have genuine concern of others' well-being, then justice automatically comes. Because there is no room, desire, or action harming other, or injustice. Uh, and then just injustice, uh, I think again, the ultimately, the, again, you see, demarcation is anything which helpful other, uh, mainly long run helpful, any action, I think that's just action. Any action, long run, harmful, is, uh, I feel, uh, unjust. 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 So therefore, I think every human action, those sort of us, the effective human action, uh, through motivation. So, so now, key thing is warm-heartedness. The, actually, the sense of concern of others' well-being. Now here, I often use explaining the compassion or sense of concern of others' well-being. Ah. Oh. You see, there are two levels. One level, mainly biological factor. Those social animals, uh, and also particular, I think social animal, and then also the mammals, you see, they, they are youngsters for youngsters' survival depend on others' care. Uh, then, biologically, it equipped some kind of motivation, some kind of emotion, the taking care, tremendous sense of concern of their well-being. That's not only human beings, but many birds and animals, obviously like dogs, cats. They are youngsters. They are survival. 
uh, should be uh, entirely depend on uh, care by Parents. mother or or should they are? Parents. Uh, I mean, there are relatives. So that's the basic nature. So according to that nature, we uh, equipped the sense of sort of closeness feeling, sense of sort of concern of others will be. Uh, so that's one level, biological level. That is common with other species of mammals, which are the same sort of kind of kasota, we, uh, we, we of sort of survival. Last few days I spent in uh, Hawaii. And one time, my previous visit to Hawaii, uh, I expressed, I wish uh, some people there, you see, carry some sort of uh, research. Some, you see, turtle, the mother turtle, come shore where? On the shores. Oh, on the shores. And then dig uh, on, on sand, then egg lay down, then cover, and then mother go. Then they what say young 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 turtle Turtles. when they as a hatch hatch, hatch. hatch. Mm. <coughs> they themselves uh, sort of carry, I mean have to fight for their own survival. Some sea birds, uh, there are a lot of things. But they, I think timing sometimes during night. Uh, so mother turtle, not there. <laughs> so therefore, the nature creates such thing. Their youngsters have to survive by their own effort. No need mother's care. So. Emotionally not equipped, taking care of their youngsters. So therefore, I'm still curious. So those were the young turtle and kept, and then some mark on the mother turtle at, at the time of laying uh, the eggs. Lay, laying the eggs. Laying, uh, laying, the eggs. Uh, laying, laying eggs, some sort of mark. Then try to put together her youngster and mother. I don't think they have the sort of sort of ability, because uh, of the ability, ability, or I don't know, a sense. You see, her caring, the mother caring, the youngster, the youngster, tremendous sort of closest feeling towards mother. I don't think because nature is such. Their survival uh, n not depend on others' care. Others, including ourselves, we human beings. Uh, so that is the biological factor. That always oriented others' attitude. If ca in case the mother, you see, a show negative attitude always to the children, to the youngster, then maybe change. Because you see, it depends on others' attitude. So that always biased, limited. Now, that kind of sort of compassion, that kind of sense of caring of other, uh, sense of concern of others' well-being, uh, take as a seed, then use human intelligence. Think, uh, what, is, what, what benefit if we uh, have compassion? The opposite of the compassion is anger, mainly hatred. What benefit? Hatred. If we analyze, uh, if we objectively observe uh, 
these different emotions. Although all these emotions are part of our mind uh, and part of our nature, uh, like external matter, I said some are useful for our health, some are harmful for our health, uh, but we never say, this is just a nature. We try to investigate, and then these two different things mixed or synthesized, then we might find some useful things. That we usually do. So why not? Since we really making investigation, what's the very sort of nature or sort of usefulness, or harmfulness of these matters. So similarly, you know, emotion, emotion world, not just one single sort of mind, the thousands of different sort of emotions, different minds. So worthwhile to investigate among these different emotions. What kind of emotion uh, effect, what kind of sort of the result? Uh, no. Uh, what kind of emotion what effect on us? And obviously, I think we all, everybody here, I think all have the experience of anger. When you fully develop anger, whether with reasons or no reasons, I think during that moment, if your friend brings some good, some nice food, I think you may not get uh, good taste. Full of anger here and you may not get sound sleep, isn't it? So usually, you see, our method is too much worry, too much stress, and about develop a frustration, anger. Then usually what we do is go outside, picnic, and see, or mu listen to music, and all this trouble, forget for the time being, uh, or relax, or tranquilizer, or alcohol, or drugs. These are temporary methods. Uh, this confirmed everybody experience. Some emotions are really disturb our mind. That's clear. No need proof, no need reason. Then, like, Sort of compassionate feeling, warm feeling. Once that develops, your stress reduces, blood pressure reduces. Uh, even your meal, the other day <laughs> in Hawaii, I just expressed, I wish, I want to have native food. So then, next day, my lunch, they arrange uh, also, you see, the native food. Uh, when I start taste. <laughs> <laughs> but I have deep respect, <laughs> deep respect. <laughs> so even, you see, not delicious, but still, you feel oh, some kind of sort of closeness with that because of respect of the uh, local people, indigenous people, their way of life, their sort of the food, their culture. So the poor family, their sort of meal may not be uh, wonderful, but with their friends, full of trust, full of sort of kasoda, respect, mutual respect, trust. Or oh, the food, then secondary, not important. Other hand, big restaurant, a lot of expensive food, expensive wines, right? But taking with some person, you have feel of, feeling of jealousy feeling of suspicion, feeling of distrust. Uh, you may not Enjoy. really should they get the Enjoy. enjoyment which suppose you should bring these facilities. This is our common experience. 
isn't it? So it is really worthwhile not only taking care about external material things, but also, you see, extremely important to take care about our inner different emotions. That is very important. So a materialistic society never bother about these things. Uh, yes, the, uh, many people, you see, follow religious faith. So the faith, tremendous sort of uh, also the uh, faith towards God as a creator, according to the religion, as a creator, tremendous sort of faith towards God. That means you totally submit it to God. So that mental attitude reduces extreme self-centered arrogance. So many emotions which based on that kind of self-centered emo- self-centered self-centeredness uh, will reduce. So it works. So whether believer or non-believer, it's really worthwhile having some knowledge about map of the mind or emotions. Then it is really helpful to know the uh, different sort of effects of these different emotions. Then, as external matters synthesize or further sort of experiment, similarly, carry further sort of experiment about these different emotions, then eventually you will find certain ways to reduce these destructive emotions and increase positive emotions. So that's the way to cultivate or to nurture uh, our sort of positive emotion which come from nature, based on biological factor. Further nurturing that then it reached second, 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 second level of compassion. Now that unbiased. Now here is one slogan. Without borders. To, to do what? To do. Compassion without, without border. The biological factor of compassion is with border. Only your own relatives. As soon as one of your relatives attitude change, their compassion no longer there. Instead of compassion, you develop suspicion, hatred, anger. Uh, So now, through training, training uh, does not mean meditate or prayer, but simply use our common sense uh, and utilize the latest scientific findings for those sort of uh, medical scientists and also the brain specialist. Now they begin to, because of that, begin to uh, say, explore. Because that, I mean, they, they start interest about mind or emotions because they are sort of research really reach very deep about brain. Then they brain activities and emotions very close link. Sometimes certain emotion, but previously every emotion must sort of due to, must take place due to brain's activities. Nowadays, different views now beginning through sheer training of mind. Uh, some change on our brain. And because I bring it to the Plasticity. So the, the discovery of plasticity seems to have opened a way in which we can understand how deliberate conscious thought processes can actually affect changes on the brain level. So through mere sort of what's the single-pointed thinking or some other sort of training of mind, 
actually effect on our brain. So whether you accept or you, whether you understand the continuation of that mind or not, that's a different matter. For the time being, different matter. Uh, but the feeling is there. The cognitive power is there. Uh, it's really a matter of kasoda. Uh, I mean, important matter for our daily life. More peaceful, more calm mind. These emotions are very, very sort of related. So therefore, the scientists now begin to uh, investigate uh, about relation, emotions, and neurons, and these things. Uh, so it is immense helpful. So they found calm mind, more calm mind, really uh, your physical so the elements create more balance. So that way, your physical condition improve. Recover okay. from illness also much faster. Uh, faster. Uh, I think simply mental state, hopeful, sort of, uh, and hopeful and fresh mind, uh, immense benefit, completely lost hope and demoralized, uh, very bad for our health. So in order to develop calm mind, fear is the destroyer of calm mind. Distrust, destroyer, opposite, uh, anger, hatred, all these are actually destroyer of peace of mind, peace of mind, calm mind. Uh, these destroyer, uh, through material sense, will never defend. Uh, we cannot defend <laughs> because of this destroyer within ourselves. External destroyer come, uh, and you can uh, sorry. put defenses. Uh, you can put defenses. Hmm? So, actually, we can say actual destroyer of your happiness is actually enemy. That kind of enemy is within yourself. So the proper way to combat that, we, you, we must find within our own mind, within, within ourselves. So it is really worthwhile, more study about uh, the nature of mind or emotion and its sort of systems. Uh, now here, in order to reduce this destroyer of inner peace, the only way is increasing this opposite uh, mind. For example, the hatred, anger, or suspicion, distrust. You must develop compassion, sense of concern of their well-being. Uh, that also, that compassion, uh, sometimes the people feel uh, I feel compassion. That's some kind of pitiness feeling. Not that. Genuine sort of sense of concern, very much based on respect. Others right, others be. So that, that kind of compassion is really very kind of the noble, noble sort of uh, emotion like that. Uh, so that so that emotion or that kind of mind increasing, then distrust reduce. Even distrust with fact. You take a little cautious, but still you respect that person. So like enemy, you know the person really harms you, hates you, and creates trouble for you. And yet, you see, we can keep genuine sense of compassion, sense of concern of their well-being on the level of they also human being. Most cases, human being. They also human being. 
just like just like myself. myself. No. And then, uh, moreover, these also, you see, my future depends on these people. So with that kind of sort of knowledge, still respect. So we can make distinction, act and action. There are negative action towards you, that sometimes you need counter sort of measure. Opus, stop, try to, because of that. Stop that. Stop that but the meantime, respect that person and still keep genuine sense of compassion, sense of uh, concern. concern over well-being. That you can do. Uh, I think to oneself, sometimes we made some mistake. Then sometimes we angry to ourselves, to oneself, to oneself. To oneself. But that very anger, you see, develop because of you love yourself. You cherish that. Because you care for yourself. Oh. So similarly, uh, out of sort of serious caring about the enemy, as a human brother, sisters, uh, they are wrongdoing, long run, very harmful for their own future, for their own Kazoda, interest. Uh, interest. Therefore, out of that sort of motivation, then try to stop uh, different ways, different ways, if possible. If not possible, then okay. <laughs> then, then, then nothing can be done. <laughs> um, there's a Tibetan saying, and the Tibetan word for a temper uh, rhymes with uh, knuckles. So the saying uh, is, when you lose your temper, just bite your knuckles. But it is, it is impossible to stop that. Just let angry, no good. So then, bite. <laughs> 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 so at least, is there some pain that distracted your anger? <laughs> like that, I think, I think that way. <laughs> so in any way, uh, so in any way, uh, through education, education, through awareness, I think we can develop deeper understanding about the system of our inner world. Uh, through that way, we can develop genuine inner peace. Once that inner peace uh, develops, justice automatically comes. So my way, uh, and many others of my friend, many scientists, many uh, uh, soci sociologists, Social no. uh, and educationists, who really concern about our sort of youth, younger generation, some sort of I say, the violence, some kind of unhealthy things you see happening. So as a result, now many occasions we're discussing what is the real causes of this unrest? And also many sort of richer family, uh, materially, everything there, but still feel some kind of asika. Uh, uh, as a person, very unhappy person. So these now, these sort of harsidae, uh, so a, a matter which which brings our questions. Yeah. Oh, plenty of money. Uh, their life, very luxurious life, but still not happy. What's wrong? It confirmed us material values, material facility have the ability to provide physical comfort, not mental comfort. With money, some satisfaction in mental, uh, that's temporary. Long run, mental comfort must develop within mind itself, through training of mind, uh, with awareness of the mental system. So therefore, oh, this is my way. No. So that's about my talk. Uh, so I'm extremely happy 
you see more and more people now really showing genuine interest a genuine concern about peace of mind so the global level or national level family level or individual level uh, everybody want i mean the, the, the all level the ultimate source of happiness is within ourselves so person who have certain way of sort of because of the way of, way of thinking and certain views then no matter what the surrounding situation you may surrounded by hostile sort of atmosphere but still you can keep peace of mind happy uh, other hand the all the best facilities surrounded and many friends but person something wrong here will not achieve happy life so i think we are 21st century 20th century really become century of real testing human mind human life immense material development take place and a lot of sort of because of the technologies uh, but at the same time the 20th century uh, eventually become century of bloodshed century of fear century of violence even beginning of this century those sort of un unhappy events actually a symptom of the past negligence or past mistake so since immense technology development material development failed to bring real sort of happy humanity now we have to find we have the time come we have to find different ways uh, to explore investigation simply investigation not just as a faith right <laughs> investigation so the education so sort of today institutions. Uh, institutions are key factor to further sort of experiment to further sort of investigate uh, i'm very happy in this country uh, like wisconsin university and emory university and stanford university and then also some university in canada i think uh, and india also now there are the in education field is some people now really feel now existing education system is not adequate we need to further some development so i'm quite sure you already have is some sort of the kasurita a pockets already here so please you carry further sort of kasurita experiment hmm. then i often is expressing the eventually we have to find some kind of curriculum in in secular education field the uh about these inner values from kindergarten up to university level the first uh, kindergarten level the uh, some sort of what's the curriculum then uh, carry as an experiment one school limited uh, student look uh five years uh what result what effect if positive result then expand another 10 school then another 100 school then things become really convincing positive definitely some positive result come then we can because of the uh, we can adopt larger scale like that even finally federal level right like that finally like un global unesco no, global level global, level. global body so oh, i think we can do that is the real sort of foundation in order to uh also the in order to build happy 21st century as a happy century 
peaceful century, peaceful, as I mentioned earlier, very much based on inner peace, compassion. Therefore, I think our ultimate goal is we should make every effort on all levels. Eventually, uh, within this century, uh, we, should, uh, sorry, we, we should have a compassionate world, peaceful, then peaceful world automatically come. We can do. That does not mean the seven billion human beings all become religious person. No. They're religious believer. They have their own different sort of way to promote this compassion, forgiveness, tolerance. Wonderful. Then those non-believers uh, or those people who are not much serious about sort of what's the, these inner values, then through education, through awareness, everybody uh, taking care of oneself. So the best way to care one's own physical well-being uh, and mental well-being. So healthy mind bring healthy body and a healthy family, like that. So I think that's the way to build, to change uh, transformation, transform our world. What do you think, some sense? <laughs> Thank you. So please think more, think more these things. I often used to telling people after my talk, if you find some sort of sensible some thing. Sense. Uh, some sense. Some sense. Then think more. Uh, and those people, uh, if he if feel, you see, not much sense, then forget, no problem. <laughs> hmm? uh, I'm leaving day after tomorrow, so no problem. <laughs> Your problem remain forever with you. <laughs> so you have to manage, you have to manage. <laughs> and then, yeah. Then one thing, America, materially, I think in the last century, I think really you made tremendous of progress. Now, as I mentioned earlier, some of these universities in this country, uh, I often, you see, uh, expressing those concerned people, now new so innovation, some of Innovation. Innovations uh, from this country. But really, really, I think worthwhile, really worthwhile. Not only just, you see, material thing, but some other sort of more civilized, sort of advanced sort of thinking, advanced education system. I think you, America, the, I think greatest democratic country. As far as the population is concerned, the most populated democratic country is India. So India also, in spite of some sort of economy, economy also now improving, and in spite of many difficulties, there are a number of people who really, you see, thinking seriously about this line. Then after all, India, thousand years, I, uh, the, I think uh, uh, more than 3,000 years, the concept of nonviolence, concept of religious harmony, these are something I feel living example on this planet. So I really have sort of great hope, America and India. So please, think more on this line. Thank you. Now questions. OK, OK, OK. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the first question, New Orleans, is, <clears throat> what are some simple choices we can make every day to live a more compassionate lifestyle? Mm. Uh, my thinking. Uh, uh, 
uh, some training uh, naturally. First, more easier, easier way, uh, then go like that. Some training, they try to face the hardest. Uh, so I think visualize uh, your uh, your uh, most disturbed person. Very right? no, no, difficult, uh, the most difficult person for uh, you. Visualize that. Then let anger. Then investigate why I develop this anger. Uh, naturally, when he was young, like school children, no basis of my anger. But the few years ago, uh, one time I met one, I think, senator or congressman. Uh, he told me his young, young boy, I think, I, I think boy, uh, uh, asked him, uh, the Saddam Hussein, when he was young, I think he also received maximum sort of affection from his mother. That kind of period must be there. The, his young son is asking him like that. So that's true. Firstly, you see, investigate. When I develop my anger towards that person, what is the reason? A certain reason. Just out of thousands different action of that person, just one action irritates me. That unfair. Some other sort of, uh, and, and then example yourself. I also, you see, occasionally lose my temper and some harsh word, some negative face, I also develop. So that person also same way. Thinking this line, uh, then every event, there are different aspects. Uh, from Buddhist viewpoint, everything is relative. So compare this, that's good. Compare this, that's bad. So no absolute good and bad. Thinking this line, then intensity of your anger, some way, quite um, research. It feels as if um, it has no basis. It's been revealed, it's kind of emptiness. So that's the way, oh, sorry. sorry. Oh. So I think that's one way. Once we really sort of uh, get some experience, some sort of combat, the negative emotion directly, once that little sort of soft, then more regularly thinking that line, that's the best way. I think for physical illness, the, some minor symptoms also, you see, have to remove, but main thing is the main illness. The doctor really deal with main sort of illness. Then all other symptoms automatically reduce. So similar way, that's I am sort of my thinking. I feel like that. Ah. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> now next question. No. Um, why should we feel compassion for people who have no remorse? Remorse, uh, Kyoba. Kyoba. Huh? Who have no remorse after committing horrible crimes? So actually, more reason feel sense of concern. Once we develop some kind of sort of strong feeling, oneness of humanity. There is also, like me, like us, same. Uh, all these sort of mistakes, essentially out of ignorance. So we have more reason, feel pity, feel concern. 
So thinking these lines. Uh, uh, next question, Your Holiness. In your struggle for worldwide peace, what has been the hardest injustice to witness? Were you able to help during such a crisis? I don't know. That is the share of the game. No, crisis mune ke liya phe i think uh, our own case with tibetan uh, for example my own case at age 16 i lost my freedom uh, the nine years with chinese communist brother sisters the little difficulties the other day, uh, when I met some Chinese from mainland China, I told them, uh, since 51 to beginning of 59, I lived with communist sort of, I'll say they, uh, friends. So during that period, I also learned how to act hypocrisy. <laughs> then, beginning of, uh, I mean, April 1959, I reached India as a refugee. That is the real time of liberating from practice of hypocrisy. <laughs> so, nine, time, nine years, difficult period. Uh, Within nine, nine years, I think the best period, 1954, 55, I was in Peking. Meeting with Chairman Mao uh, and all Chinese leaders. At that time, I very, and also I get a lecture about socialism, about international uh, so they, uh, so, so, uh, socialist sort of movement. movement. I very much impressed. At that time, uh, of course, still, as far as Marxism is concerned, and the socio-economy theory is concerned, I still, I believe I'm Marxist. So at that time, I learned these things. I very much impressed. So, and Chairman Mao himself, oh, very nice person. Uh, so at that time, I offer, I want to join Chinese Communist Party. But then the concerned officials say, wait, wait. Uh, I think they, they may know already their party eventually spoiled or rotten party. <laughs> so in any way, uh, so that period, I think very, very hopeful sort of period. One example. 1955 summer, when I returned from Peking to Lhasa, the same road the previous year I went. So on the road, I met the, uh, what's the uh, I think, uh, General. Uh, General. Uh, on General. Hmm? Uh, the 18th Army the Division, sort of, the general, uh, Tang Koha. Very nice person, very nice person. He coming from Lhasa to Peking. So we met on the road. And uh, then I told him, last year, when I coming through this road, a lot of suspicion, a lot of fear. Now I'm coming back full of hope, no fear now, I told him. So that kind of sort of situation at that time. Then, end of 55, beginning of 56, things become really difficult. So that become worse and worse and worse. So nine years, uh, quite sort of, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry. 
It's my, particularly my position. One way, I'm Tibetan. I have to sort of, uh, I said they, because I take concern about their well-being. Other hand, uh, I also you see, have to sort of every effort, including hypocrisy, <laughs> to make please uh, the Chinese authority. Then finally, uh, no, no any sort of the choice except escape. Then last, now 53 years, I'm a refugee. And uh, beside our sort of work as a refugee community, for refugee community, but uh, news or event inside Tibet, particularly the last uh, uh, one or two decades, particularly the last one decade, really terrible. And these days also very, very terrible. So a lot of sort of what's today, sad things, right? difficulties there. Now, 2000, uh, March 10th, 2008, as soon as I received the, the information uh, from Tibet, the Lhasa people now taking or moving sort of demonstration. And as soon as afternoon, I received that information. And I really get some sort of, sort of same experience which 10th March 1959, similar sort of, sort of uh, anguish, no, yes, anxiety, anxiety uh, hopelessness feeling. So during that period, I visualized those Chinese leaders, hardliner leaders on the spot. I visualized them and practice uh, taking and giving practice. That means taking their anger, their fear, their distrust and give them my sort of patience and forgiveness and uh, compassion. So that kind of sort of practice, of course, won't help to solving the problem, but for maintain, in order to maintain my peace of mind, immense help. So things are really desperate. Easily can develop anger and shouting, but deliberately try to keep try peace of mind with sense of concern of their own well-being. So that's my own little experience. And, and here, one sort of example, one Tibetan monk. I know him very well. Uh, uh, 59, he also arrested by Chinese authority and put in Chinese prison or Chinese gulag next 18 years. Then early 80, uh, uh, after Ting Xiaoping's liberal, uh, uh, more lenient sort of attitude, uh, these people released and also, you see, opportunity, find opportunity come to India. So since we know, since I know him very well, so I have some casual talk. Then he told me, during 18 years in Chinese prison, he faced some occasion, some dangers. I thought danger on his life, maybe. I asked, what kind of danger? And his answer is danger of losing compassion towards Chinese. So trained person, it's that kind of attitude. It is really important to keep compassion towards your perpetrator. Uh, losing compassion towards perpetrator, he consider very serious danger. So result, such person's sort of mental state, 
no sign of trauma. Trauma. Yeah, trauma. Uh, I think you also know one time our scientific meeting, you see, we, this subject was to come. And then some scientists very eager you see, to examine, to interview. Then later they found that these were the people very unusual in spite of the sort of several years, sort of that difficult sort of period. But these, uh, these people's mental state, very peaceful, very calm. So immense benefit to one individual like that. So that's my own little experience. That does not mean I have no anger, no. I often lose my temper. <laughs> my staff member, they know if something wrongs, oh, then I burst. <laughs> yes. Um, two last questions. Uh, yes. What role would you... Two, three, two, three, three. Yes. What role would you say spirituality or religion plays in the peace processes in conflict societies? If follow any major religions sincerely, seriously, then all major religious tradition, you say, have sort of great potential. Uh, now here, uh, many years ago, in Argentina, we had one meeting. Some scientists, some religious uh, leaders, uh, one scientist, the Chilean, uh, I don't know his name, I can't remember. Uh, he, great physicist, or quantum physicist, uh, he uh, told in our gathering, he told he, uh, physicist. However, he should not develop attachment uh, towards his own scientific field, he mentioned. So that's very true. So, for example, I'm Buddhist. I should not develop attachment towards Buddhism. Because once I develop attachment, attachment is, you see, narrow-minded. Uh, then, you see, with that kind of narrow-minded, you can't see the other things objectively. Uh, so your sort of faith towards your own religion is actually biased. So I think that's, I think, important. The major religious uh, sort of uh, practitioner. Uh, I think here I always making distinction. Faith and respect. Faith towards one's own religion. Respect to all religions. There's sufficient reasons. All those major religious traditions served Humanity last a thousand years, and at present, millions of people still get benefit, immense exp inspiration. inspiration. Then, in the future, also, uh, these uh, one of the, remain one of the source of hope. So, there's plenty of reasons to respect. So, I am Buddhist. Sometimes I describe, I'm staunch Buddhist. Reason, many texts which we learned from very young age, childhood, your childhood hmm? those argument, uh, those critics of argument uh, by Buddhist masters, Buddhist logicians, uh, mainly Nalanda masters, you see, a lot of sort of critic, sort of critical sort of investigation and debate. So we study, we both study that. Uh, I think as far as sort of study is concerned, we are same. Now only difference, he disrobed, I'm wrote. <laughs> <laughs> and some field, he had some 
more, advan more advantage. In <laughs> some cases, I have more advantages. <laughs> <laughs> so, since we study these things, so it, it easily you should find some contradictions. Uh, so therefore, I, I consider I'm a staunch Buddhist. However, I sincerely, seriously respect all other major religious traditions. Whenever I have the opportunity, I make a pilgrimage. A pilgrimage to different sort of holy sites. Holy sites. Uh, holy sites. This practice I start in 1975 in India. Whenever I have the opportunity, I take pilgrimage to all different uh, city, uh, religious sort of sacred places. So one time, uh, I got an invitation from John Main's a group. A group. Christian in meditation. England. Uh, uh, Christian med uh, World Christian Meditation Community. Uh, I think firstly I met John Main himself. I think in America or Canada. Canada. I think Canada I met. I very much impressed. We sit together. He carries some kind of prayer with some musical instrument. Then tear comes. Very sincere when praising God, appeal to God, tear comes. I very much impressed. And then, like Mother Teresa and many other, and all American, the uh, Thomas Merton, uh, uh, the monk, Tapest monk, oh, wonderful. And millions of sort of Christian practitioners all over the world who truly dedicated serving to others, mainly in education field and also sort of health field, such sort of tremendous sort of what say dedication. The, the dedication come from come from their faith. So there are plenty of reasons, respect. And then practical also, you see the, all these major religious traditions, the practice of love. Compassion, forgiveness, tolerance, self-discipline, contentment, same, all religions. No, no basis of argument. In the philosophical field, yes, there are big differences. Even within the uh, theistic religion, there are differences. And among the non-theistic religion, also there are differences. But that's a necessity in order to Strengthening their real message, message of love, we need different sort of philosophical views in order to promote, in order to strengthen this practice. Even within the Buddhism, uh, the teacher, Buddha as a teacher, same teacher taught different philosophical views. These different philosophical views itself contradictory each other. Then the question, why Buddha taught contradictory philosophy? Then usually I tell him, uh, that not due to Buddha's own mind, still not very clear, confused. So one day he says something, next day he says something, not that way. <laughs> then uh, next question, or then other, other possibility, he deliberately tried to create more confusion among his disciples. Still, no, certainly not. <laughs> so then answer is, uh, he compelled to tell different views according among his own follower, mental, different mental, dis, mental sort of disposition and mental capacity. So uh, he compelled, he had to sort of tell different views in order to promote practice of love, compassion, forgiveness, these things. So from that, we can easily learn the other tradition. Oh, say there is creator. So everything depends on him. A very powerful sort of way of approach, like that. So therefore, 
What? What? What point? Three thousand. Uh, I forget. What? What is? Oh. So you see distinction, respect, and faith. So like that. And then next question. <laughs> um, what do you see to be the most serious conflict or global issue that needs to receive attention? I think there are plenty of problems. Oh. Uh, these days, I think just uh, these days, I think Syria. Very sad. And also the problem in Afghanistan, and also in Pakistan, within Pakistan, some terrorists. Sad. And inside Tibet also is quite sad. Uh, recently, one good, good news or good thing is now Burma, the authoritarian military rule now changing. <laughs> Just today, I heard uh, now Aung San Suu Kyi now possibility go outside Burma. Uh, so now I'm hoping, meeting, meeting her, I really admire that uh, tiny lady, very small. Uh, <laughs> Wonderful sort of determination, wonderful willpower. So many years, like house arrest and difficulties, but her sort of face, peaceful face, never change. And her sort of spirit never damaged. Wonderful, wonderful. So that's one good news. And then, then what else? Of course, there are good things. There are many, I think, many different parts of the world. Ah, good things also, you see, there. So, so I think overall, in spite of some sad events here and there, overall picture, I think humanity becoming more sort of civilized, thinking more, sort of, I say, uh, mature. Uh, mature. This is my view. So I always you see, uh, say no, those sort of questioners, those questions, or oh, humanity basically bad, and human future, the doomed way. That basically, uh, I disagree. We are uh, judging 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, later part of the 20th century, big change. Within my lifetime, I saw big change. Very hopeful. Now, this 21st century, just the beginning of the first decade of the 21st century, now the continuation of the later part of the 20th century, now further goes in including taking care about the mind. And now, a lot of the number of occasions, politicians, political statement, also you see, there's some room, the word of compassion. These are wonderful, isn't it? Things are changing. Things are changing. And then, economic crisis. Uh, itself, bad. But one way, it is good to remind you, now you should not take for granted. You must make new thinking new sort of effort. Good, very good, isn't it? So even bad event, you can transform. It can be a very good lesson. And a further sort of effort, more wiser sort of, more holistic way, like that. And then? Uh, the final question, um, I think Your Holiness, you have kind of answered it. How do you remain optimistic when there is so much distress and pain in the world? I think the simple answer is, it is far better to remain optimistic. <laughs> uh. Okay. Uh. Wait. Look, look, look. There is reasons 
if you remain, keep optimism, then you may find effort to try to find ways and means to overcome that problem. So uh, even sort of uh, the 100% sure find ways and means, but there is possibility to find some ways and means to overcome. Uh, right from the beginning, you lose all, all hope and demoralize uh, and pessimistic, pessimistic. pessimistic, then no ground making effort, then that's a hundred percent failure. Keep optimism, uh, one percent or five percent, ten percent possible overcome. So as a human being, under this sort of head, uh, uh, this brain, you see, there are a lot of sort of activities uh, to keep optimism, say, or keep optimism, keep optimism. <laughs> so that's why I keep optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 Thank you.